My topic is a, a, a bit of the general overview for FAI, which is um, fortunately going to be sp spoken about in much more detail and in a granular way by the remainder of the, the speaker. So I'm just going to kind of hit the high points. And Brian did a great job earlier talking about the diagnosis of this. So uh, even though I'm giving this presentation, uh, uh, I do want to acknowledge some of my other colleagues that have participated in that. Um, as you can see, Brian, Chris, and, and Thomas have taught me a lot about this area, specifically with regard to, uh, to, the, to the competitive athlete. Let's just step back and identify why FAI is kind of interesting to all of us in this, in this population. It's been recognized as uh, really the leading cause of osteoarthritis in the hip in the absence of dysplasia. And that's the large contribution of Reinhold Gans and Michael Luding and, uh, and others who have uh, taught us about this. And the reason it's particularly exciting is now as our techniques improve to also manage cartilage and labral disease, uh, much with the products that you'll learn about uh, and have seen today from, from the product managers, it gives us the opportunity not only to correct the underlying mechanical deformity, but also to, to treat the cartilage and, and potentially preserve the joint. In terms of the epidemiology of FEI, you know, what, what can we hang our hat on? Probably a lot of this work has been done abroad. If you look at the general demographic from this Gosvig study, it says about 17% of males and 4% of females have this. But again, I think everybody in this room is not treating just the general population. A lot of us are also treating this um, athletic population. So if you look at these other studies here, uh, you'll see uh, Chris Larson published that it was 90% of uh, NFL athletes that had this in combine studies. Jeff Neppel out of Wash U showed that about 94% of football players have either a cam or a pincer type uh, finding. And then Chris and I published this in the Wings and, and Minnesota Wild population, where 70% of the elite hockey athletes had this at their preseason physicals on their imaging. So probably the population that we're seeing, which is often the young athletic sports patient, has this in a much higher percentage. This is a gross oversimplification, and Brian did a great job of talking about this earlier. But Martin Beck published these concepts. And I would just point out that CAM and pincer, although they're terms we use, are, are, are grossly oversimplified. The idea being that you have this loss of offset or asphericity on the femoral side, that you have overcoverage on the acetabular side. And again, most commonly, when there's one, there's the other. Uh, but we'll dig, dig into this in a little more detail to point out how there are several different specific types of CAM and pincer lesions and how we need to think about those. Again, I think everybody in this room understands this concept, which is the labral tear is often what comes to our clinic with FAI. Uh, somebody gets an MR arthrogram, they come with this diagnosis, but that is in some ways the smoke. And let's remember the underlying fire, if you will, is the bony deformity. So we know from the, the, the large series that have been done by uh, high volume providers, Mark Philippon, Brian Kelly have published that the number one reason for a failure of this surgery is an inadequate correction of the underlying deformity. This is a Venn diagram that, again, was uh, talked about nicely in the previous uh, discussion, that this is a continuum. As Ben pointed out, you see uh, kind of the dysplasia morphology, which is increased anaversion, uh, decreased acetabular coverage, maybe a predilection to the female population, and then impingement, which is all of the opposite, retroversion, a large cam lesion, a deeper socket. And in fact, uh, this Venn diagram is not accurate because you can have dysplasia and FAI findings in the same patient. So you can have proximal femoral cam type deformity with a shallow socket it, and those cases get complicated in a hurry. Brian already showed this earlier, which is uh, uh, the concept of, of coming to this diagnosis for FAI is, is somewhat challenging because it isn't just a simple one event that leads to this. It's chronic, often anterior groin pain or discomfort. As he mentioned, Brian and Pete Dreyevich published this onion or layered concept where you think about all the possible pain generators. And then finally, once we identify what we think is the pain generator, then we have to give, grow through that radiographic analysis. Brian showed us all those measures, the alpha angle, lateral center edge angle, measuring head neck offset, measuring uh, your, your uh, uh, tonus angle. The concepts here are fairly simple, though. All of these are two-dimensional surrogate measures that we're trying to, to get for a three-dimensional problem. So for me, in my practice, that's increased use of three-dimensional imaging. Uh, in general, if a patient's going to the operating room with FAI, I tend to get a low-dose protocol CT so we can look at those factors, look at the acetabular version, look at femoral version, look at the neck shaft angle, and then characterize better the 3D deformity of the cam lesion to decide what's the best way to, to access it and approach it. Why um, has this been humbling for me? This is uh, some studies that we've done working with iResults, Chris and Brian in this area. You can actually see on the left side of the screen, this is the same patient. And all we've changed here is the patient's pelvic tilt. And I think you can appreciate at the bottom of the screen a large crossover sign that would suggest a big pincer lesion. At the top of the screen, the same patient with a different pelvic tilt and the crossover is gone. 
So two-dimensional measurements can also get us into trouble if we don't pay attention to the fact that subtle changes in the position of the pelvis, for example, on a supine or standing x-ray, uh, will, will change your appreciation of acetabular version and deformity. Ben already talked about this nicely. Uh, in terms of dividing up FAI, if we think about the acetabular side first, this is the so-called rim impingement. Michael Lunig and Martin Beck published on this, in which uh, the labrum and the cartilage is driven into the head neck junction. This leads to intra-substance damage in the labrum. And uh, when, you, when you scope in the OR, when you see an indurated labrum, one that started to be calcified or ossified, that tends to be more the rim impingement type of morphology. This is what it looks like in the OR. In a, in a healthy 20-year-old patient, the labrum shouldn't look like this. It's damaged, it's indurated. You see this large area of overcoverage uh, uh, on the cephalad aspect of the acetabulum. But why that's important to separate out, and Brian again touched on this earlier as, as a surgeon who also does open work, cephalad retroversion is the one we're looking for as arthroscopists, where there's an area of, of proximal retroversion with more normal acetabular relationship uh, down below. We have to distinguish that from this group, which is true acetabular retroversion. As you can see here, uh, this is accompanied by posterior insufficiency, in which case the whole acetabulum is retroverted. Uh, this is important because this may be a case where you would, you would contemplate an anaverting periacetabular osteotomy, uh, potentially. And then we have these more challenging cases of profunda, where the whole hip is deep, or protrusio, where the head goes inside as well. So all of these would be quote unquote pincer lesions, but we might approach them a little differently. Well, what about the, the femoral side of, of FAI? We know that cam lesion morphology affects things differently. In this case, as Ben showed, the cam lesion rotates into the acetabulum and delaminates that chondrolabral junction. It looks like this on the side of injury. And then there's this counter coup effect that Reinhold, Reinhold Gans has taught us about, which is where the head levers out and starts to separate the cartilage on the opposite side of the joint. I would point out that cam lesions are more complicated if you look uh, in more detail. This is one cam lesion that would still be characterized as an alpha angle of 70 degrees on an x-ray, but you can see here it extends from the anterior aspect of the perfusing vessels down to a four o'clock position. On the other hand, you take this cam lesion, also an alpha angle of 70 degrees, but now uh, it's a much more complicated lesion extending from behind the retinacular vessels down inferiorly. So these are, are the same appearance on an x-ray, but two very different lesions in the OR for you. Why does all this matter? Well, I would just point out it affects both your non-athletic and athletic population. For the non-athlete, like me, it's more of a risk of arthritis later in life. For the athlete, it's more of a concern for immediate return to play in sports. So let's give credit to Bill Harris, who taught us about this. I took this right from his paper. What he said was that 90% of the patients when he saw later in life that had so-called idiopathic OA, it really wasn't that idiopathic. Most of the time, if he could go back and look at his x-rays, he saw an underlying explanation for the deformity. So this paper from John Cloas, he points out this concept well. He looked at all of his patients from a collective series that had had a hip replacement at a young age in life, under the age of 50, and said, let's break this down a little bit. If you kind of looked and saw what was the labeled explanation, uh, 200 of them had AVN, uh, 150 of seven of them had either trauma or inflammatory arthritis. So maybe those were good explanations. But when you break down this primary OA group, 163 had dysplasia and 121 were labeled as unknowns. When you look at the unknowns in more detail, those were FAI. We all know that slipped epiphyses look like FAI. So now if you group together dysplasia and impingement, over 90% of these hips had a reason for having a young hip replacement. So that suggests that maybe if we had gotten to this hip at a young age, we would have had an opportunity to intervene and save that joint. For the athlete, it's different. They have FAI, they lose range of motion, they get impingement in their functional range of sport, then they get cartilage and labral injury. They don't come to URI till it starts hurting their performance or pain, and then they care about this when they can't play. So in general, that's really been our opportunity is to, is to uh, intervene at these different, different steps for good outcomes. So in terms of how we accomplish that for the global picture, I'm gonna skip through these because the subsequent speakers are gonna talk about this. We've discussed the capsulotomy, which then allows us, I think, to do a more extensile rim exposure, which then allows us to work more circumferentially along the extra capsular side of the joint. Once we've done that, again, with Apollo-type devices, we can expose the rim and see the areas of focal retroversion. That then allows us to correct the rim deformity, which I know subsequent talks are gonna discuss. With our improved techniques, once we do this, we can now reestablish that suction seal that Ben talked about, which is critical. Knotless devices like this allow us to do this in a quick uh, and non-invasive fashion. I often do this now and, and address this pathology before even addressing the CAM delamination so we can appreciate this area of the pathology better. 
And then finally, our more extensile capsulotomies, as shown here, for example, with the T-capsulotomy, allow us to then see the head neck junction and perform a more thorough cam resection. That then allows us to fluoroscopically hold ourselves to a higher standard for a better correction in all planes. And what that's leading us to find is when we do this thorough correction, our, our outcomes are more robust. Ben Wakuchu from HSS just published this systematic review with Brian Kelly and Neil in the group. Uh, Simon Steppaker from the, uh, from the uh, Swiss group in Bern published 10-year follow-up. And we're getting more robust outcomes, not just in terms of short-term favorable results, but long-term avoidance of conversion to hip arthroplasty. And again, more recent systematic reviews from Griffin and his group and, and uh, Kierkegaard and their group indicating very favorable PROs. So in summary, there's a very high rate of return to sport after FAI surgery. We don't know that we prevent arthritis with FAI surgery, but we think it's possible. Athletes seem to be uniquely affected, and hopefully our future studies will, will uh, help to push the envelope in, in saving the hip joint beyond just our short-term outcomes. So thank you.